So, and now about my actual presentation. If, if you know me, I like Java EE. And today I want to talk about the topic of cloud native Java EE. So, who knows the term cloud native in cloud native applications? Who has heard that term? Hands up. Only one? Okay, so that is um, pretty much a buzzword. But what, it's, uh, what it means is that you have enterprise applications that are somewhat born in the cloud, right? That run perfectly in a cloud environment. But since this is a kind of buzzword, and I would say being, um, being there in the cloud or not actually doesn't matter that much. What it's more about and what it's more important is having a modern and a reasonable way how to run and how to build enterprise software. So what has emerged is a thing called the 12 factor app. These are some well concepts that are out there how to how to build a modern enterprise application with some concerns some of them are quite obvious at first and some of them have quite some impacts for example that you should track all your code in under revision control but which also includes code for infrastructure and configuration, which makes things uh, quite interesting um, if you think about that more. The same is true for configuration and um, very important, having similar um, environments for production and all the other environments, if possible. Because what it all that is about, that you want to have applications that are built by automation and that also um, run with a high quality. And in order to do so, you want to test everything right? that is needed and you want to eliminate um, all kind of differences in environments. right? If your pro production environment differs a lot from the test environment, because you use a different database, you use different external systems that are not available and so on and so forth, then these differences are not tested later on for production, right? So what you would do ideally, that you would have an environment that looks as similarly as possible. And I will show one way how this can be achieved. So I, what I would like to do now is to um, live code everything from scratch. I will live code two enterprise applications while two because one is boring right and if I only deploy one application then we don't have the whole complexity of several systems um, communicating with each other because this is what all that is about having um, um, distributed <laughs> systems and I will deploy that in a modern cloud environment so I will use Maven to build Java EE projects and I have a script here that is somewhat like a Maven archetype that creates some projects very fast and what it does it creates a default hello cloud like hello world project that is basically an empty Java E7 project and I can show you what I just created by open that in IntelliJ hello cloud And this will be an empty Java E7 project. What it means that we have the Maven POM file. So for those of you who are familiar with Maven, this means we only have one dependency. This is all we need, a Java E7 API that is very important provided. That means it will not end up in our deployment artifact, in our WAR file. The whole application will be packaged to a thin WAR file that will be deployed on a modern application server. And what I'm doing first, I'm coding a Hello World example, of course. The other thing that is um, already availab um, available because it's always needed is the JAXRS configuration to bootstrap the JAXRS application. And then I will code, of course, a Hello resource that is a JAXRS resource because what we will do, we will make our Hello World example available via HTTP. 
And for JaxOS, we annotate our class with add path, right? Hello, which will make our methods accessible under slash hello path. And we have a get method that, of course, outputs a string that returns hello Fukuoka, right? And since we are in a Java E environment, we probably have some managed bean that actually returns that for us. So let's greeter, let's refactor this into a managed bean that returns our complex business logic, which in this case is our greeting. Greeter, return hello. And the method we're going to return is hello Fukuoka, right? And this is basically our application, which is very simple for now. And what we want to do now is that we deploy this, for now, very basic application in a modern cloud environment. And what that means is, since I said we want to uh, specify the whole infrastructure as code to be automated, to be, um, well, actually trackable under revision control, to be um, that you can later on see what, what happened, right? So you have everything defined as code. And therefore, we need some sort of technology that makes this possible. And who of you has um, used or knew, uh, heard the term Docker before, Docker containers? Who has heard of the term Docker containers with the nice blue whale? OK, a few. That's, that's good. And what Docker containers are is basically a way um, to combine the benefits of virtual machines with a native performance. So what it does, a container, a container is a way to run Unix processes as part of the Unix kernel. But these containers are built and packaged and shipped in a standardized way. That means we build our Docker container once from our code that I will code in a second and we can publish it somewhere and in all the environments later on we just pull the docker container and run it everywhere in the same way and I will show you this how that is done in order to have a docker container we need a so-called docker file that is the recipe what is included in our container and the way how docker containers work is they have a lot of layers that is a file system, which is basically a copy on write file system. So everything you're doing there, every step, every layer you add, is a new layer in your resulting Docker container. That means if we want to run our application here, we need an operating system, we need Java, we need a Java application server, and we need our application, right? And this will be later on the layers. And why that is a benefit, I will explain that in a second. So what we do here, we always start from somewhere. And in our case, we will start from an operating system plus Java plus an application server because we just want to add our application here, right? And what I have here is a private re a Docker repository that is basically an image of a Wildfly application server. So it contains everything we need to run a Java 7 Wildfly plus an application that we just add. And the application we add, that is our WAR file, right? Residing under target um, Hello Cloud WAR file, which will be built via Maven. And we will include this in the deployment directory. Opt Wildfile standalone deployments, right? And that's it. And everything else comes from the base image. And this is a very nice approach, and I will show you why in a second. So what we do, since we have a Maven project, we call Maven Clean Package to build the WAR file. And this, since it is um, a lightweight, thin WAR approach, will build very fast in 1.7 seconds, because it is only 4 kilobyte in size. This is very nice because we don't ship the implementation since we use Java EE. Everything that WAR file includes is just our classes I wrote. And that makes the whole thing very fast. And what we will do now, 
we built our Docker container by using this Docker file. So we will have an image name that is, of course, hello cloud colon one for tag or version one with the current directory. And this runs very fast. And the reason why uh, for that is that Docker can cache everything. So everything that is included with Java and the application server is just taken from that image that is already there and the last layer is just being added. That is 4 kilobyte in size, so it's very fast. And what we can see, if we look at the, the images, the Hello Cloud image is in total 600 megabyte because it contains a lot, right? The operating system plus Java plus an application server, but our build was very fast since almost everything is already there and we just add 4 kilobyte. And the same is true if we now want to push it because what a push is, we make it accessible under that registry, under this URL. This is a private registry um, where we can push it to and since these layers are always available also after the image is being built, this will run very fast since it only pushes the last layer and everything else is already there. Otherwise I couldn't show the demo because if I want to push 600 megabyte it would take a long time. But it still takes a long time because the Wi-Fi is quite slow but it is at least possible. And it says pushed and it already will be finished soon. So that is quite interesting because now we can deploy our Docker containers very fast, right? Since we only pushing back and forth a couple of kilobytes in our thin wall approach. And now it's there. And what I can do now, I can take the Docker container and run it locally, for example. So what I can say, take the image you just being, uh, you just built, make it accessible under this port for local host, and then, voila, it runs the Docker container. And the Docker container, as you can see, contains an application server that just starts up and it also includes my WAR file. So the auto deployment directory contains the WAR file, so it deploys it. And what, the, uh, what that means is that I can access it under localhost 8080, hello cloud, right? Resources, JaxRS application name, and hello, my JaxRS um, resource, and it will output hello Fukuoka. This is now running in a Docker container. And do you have any questions so far? We can stop this now again. What we can also do is that we go one step further and take it to the cloud environment, right? So we now have one Docker container. If we have some cloud environment that can run Docker containers, it can go to the registry, pull our application and just run it. But what is even more interesting is how to collaborate with several applications, right? Because this is what we're doing. We have a database uh, probably, we have some external systems that needs to be configured later on, right? And we have some um, options to connect networks together, so we can connect Docker containers together. And what I want to show you is a technology called Kubernetes. Kubernetes is originally what has been developed by Google and is a way how to run containers with production grade. So what it does, it takes the containers, something like I built, and makes it accessible in a reasonable way. You can define services, you can define networks and tie them together. They will run in a fail-safe and zero deployment way. It automatically includes uh, blue-green deployments and so on and so forth. I will show you this in a second. So it is a very helpful way how to get rid of manual um, environment configuration because otherwise, you know, your administrator has to set up some proxy server, some load balancer, and so on and so forth. And here you can specify all this in an easier way as 
infrastructure as code. And I will show you this, how that works. So what I have here on my local machine is I have a Kubernetes cluster running locally here in a similar way as it would run in production. So I will issue the command kube control to control it, my Kubernetes cluster. Kube control gets services, gives me the services running, what a service is, I will explain that in a second. And this is just the default stuff that is running in Kubernetes, the internal things. So this means no application has been running right now. And also we have some kind of pods. And what that is, I will explain you while I live code the Kubernetes configuration for my new application here. It mostly looks like a um, directory that is called K8S, 8 for 8 characters, Kubernetes, to make it shorter. And the actual configuration is stored in a YAML file. And the YAML file will contain the actual configuration as code for my services and deployments and everything you want to specify in Kubernetes. So what we do first, we specify a service. What a service is, it is an abstraction over your application. If you have a Hello Cloud application, then you will have a Hello Cloud service. If you have a database, then you will have an appropriate service for that and also for all kind of external systems. And what a service does, it routes the traffic over port 8080, for example, to one or more instances. So you already, per default, have the concept of load balancing. One service is accessed from the outside and it routes the traffic to one or more actual instances that run your actual containers. And that is defined in a so-called deployment. And a deployment also has a name, Hello Cloud. And what it does, it takes a Docker image, for example, the very image that I just be built, Hello Cloud in tag one, and runs it, right? So it goes to your, let's change this to always, it goes to your Docker registry, takes the image, the same that I've just done locally, and runs it. Only one here in my case. I could specify several if I like to. And it automatically does the routing from the service to my deployment. And that can be very helpful later on. I will show you this. So what we now have, we have our, that's all we need for here. We have our specification how our application is being tied together in the Docker container on our Kubernetes cluster. And we can have several clusters or one cluster set up with several environments, with a small part for production, a small part for te testing and so on and so forth. And what I will do now, I will deploy it onto my local running cluster by saying apply. Apply applies the configuration in a directory, k8s for example, and it says, oh, I forgot something, very good. It says service has been deployed and actually the deployment has an error here. This is very good because I explain what that is. As part of the blue-green fail-safe deployment, you can specify a liveness probe. What the liveness probe is, it defines a way to check whether my container is alive and runs as expected. So I have several um, possibilities. For example, I can issue an HTTP request to something. To Hello Cloud Resources Hello, for example, under port 8080. And if that returns something that is HTTP 2 or something, or 3 or something, that it basically means, yes, it works, then it tells Kubernetes this container is alive. And if it's not alive, I can, they can restart new ones and route your traffic so that your service always will be served by one or more containers. This will be interesting later on. So let's reapply re it. The nice story about apply it, if you change something in the configuration, it will track what you've changed. So you can always just run apply, apply over your infrastructure as code and it will deploy and ap ap apply the appropriate changes. 
So now we can actually check whether it works. Cube control get services. Now we have a new service, Hello Cloud, that is available under a specific port. That is the external port and an internal port. We can also set up a DNS name for this. But for now, it is actually sufficient to access our IP of our cluster with the port for our service. And now call Hello Cloud resources hello and it will output hello Fukuoka from our service from our Kubernetes cluster so this actually accesses the service and the whole thing is backed by one instance that is the container deployment for a hello cloud that is currently running and the running was checked by this liveness probe so it was started the docker container right and it checked whether it's been running. So now, this is nice, but we want to include a second application, right? Because then we see some collaboration here. And in order to do so, we want to enhance our application to do something more, which needs a, com a calculation from a second external system. So let's say we have a second request for a path that includes a greeting, hello somebody, hello name public string hello for a name that comes from a path parameter string name and it returns a name from our greeter right and this will be a very complex calculation so of course we have to ask a second system and this will be included via another managed bean the greeting processor and this greeting processor will then over HTTP access our second application return greeting processor calculate if I could spell calculate greeting from our name and this of course will then ask the second application to do so and since we're in a Java EE environment we can use the whole Java E7 API which nicely includes um, an HTTP client for JAXRS client on the client side so we can initialize a client this is built by the client builder give us a new client this is a so-called JAXRS client and very important on application server shutdown please close the client to not having resource leaks via the pre-destroy annotated method. And this client will then issue a target to some URL. So now it's interesting which URL do we specify, right? Normally we take some IP address or some DNS name to some external system, but this can change on specific environments, right? So we have to configure the IP address and then tell this is the production system, this is the test database and so on and so forth. But what we can do now, since we are in a Kubernetes cluster, we can specify the logical service name that we want to access. For example, greeting processor. So wherever you're running, give us the greeting processor service for our environment. Under port, let's say, 8080 and access then the URL greeting processor resources greetings because we will add a new greeting there and make this URL available so that is the nice story I will show you later on how this is done that it can access our second application via a logical name this will be called the greeting processor and this will communicate via JSON, so we will post a new greeting to be calculated and we get the calculated greeting with the full name back. So we will create a JSON object. Again, for JSON, Java E7 ships something very nice called JSONP, which is an API to create JSON objects uh, programmatically. So we can use this and not needing any other external dependency we will create a JSON object with a name that has the name and outputs it as a request JSON object 
and then we can send this request over the target with media type application JSON and post it as the request body entity and then read the response which will also be JSON so post the name and get the greeting back this can also be a JSON object this is the very nice story so we can just use our API here and then take the response and take the greeting which then will contain the calculated greeting right and as always clean code right create request let's clean up this method here to be more readable create request send request um, extract greeting so now this is more readable right resort this appropriately and this will now access our second application over HTTP and the second application will be included right now so again we will start up um, a Maven Java 7 project from scratch which as you saw will be called greeting processor it contains the same story as before an empty Java 7 project that will be built into a small WAR file let's open this in our IDE of choice greeting processor with which is also a brand new project here containing containing the same story as before and it will include well a greeting resource which will then calculate our greeting so again this is annotated via add path right greetings what you just saw so we will have a resource for our greetings where we can add new greetings over JSON and get the response back immediately so we can post something here right and get a JSON object back we can create a new greeting from JSON JSON object which will then contain our name right and that name will be used to calculate our greeting via a greeting processor managed bean right and that is being used greeting processor calculate greeting from name and this method will then return our greeting and this will be output as I said as a JSON object with a greeting and that's it on the JAXRS side and of course the very complex calculation hello plus name on our business logic side and this will then output our JSON object and this application will be used by the first application this is the greeting processor that takes raw greeting names and outputs the calculated greeting and again we want to run this in a modern cloud environment and we want to run this in a docker container so what do we need? we need a docker file here and in the same way as before we will have a base image that is again our wildfly base image that of course then contains our war file greeting processor dot war that gets added in the application server um, auto deployment directory standalone deployments that means we can run this and build it in the same way as before so now maven build also runs very fast we also have a very small war file and we can issue a docker build that builds our container 
containing everything from Java to the application server to our actual application. Greeting processor version 1. Built very fast, finished. What is not that fast because of the very slow Wi-Fi is the Docker push. So again, we will have to make that accessible to our Docker registry. And this will push again. It was very fast because the base image with our application server is the same as before and it's already there still. And this is pushed. And also, of course, we will run it, well, as I said, in the Kubernetes cluster as a specific service that is then accessed later on. So, in a similar way, we have the configuration directory k8s with the specific YAML configuration file. Now for our greeting processor configuration. So now we have a service again, right? That is called greeting processor. And with this plus the port 8080, this is exactly what will be accessed here. You have the greeting processor service name, the logical service name that will be incorporated with Kubernetes plus that port 8080. And this is w will be accessed here in the first application. And this is, of course, backed by images, uh, by running instances again specified by deployment, right? Which has a name again, greeting processor, and now our second image from greeting processor. Again, version one. You can get rid of this here. Always pull it, and that's it. We just want to have one running um, uh, um, instance here. And now, yeah, now it's pushed. So in the same way, we can apply the configuration to Kubernetes from our configuration directory. It will create a deployment and a service for our greeting processor. And now you will see the new service for the greeting processor here with a different port. So we can access this as well. No, sorry, no localhost the um, IP from our locally running um, Kubernetes cluster with now the greeting processor. Resources, right, same story as before, not hello, but greetings. And of course, method not allowed since this only allows a post, right? So actually we have to post a JSON object, right? So just for the demo here, I will sh uh, show this um, from scratch using curl or any REST client of your choice. Content type application JSON with our JSON object containing a name, for example, Duke. And this will be posted to our greeting processor that then outputs the greeting. Hello, Duke. And of course, we want now want to combine these two and make it accessible from the first application. That means, since I coded it here, we have to redeploy our first application. Since it's still running, right? The service Hello Cloud is still there. So what we do now, we have to rebuild it, of course, using Maven. So our first application is now being rebuilt. It's still very small, so this is still very fast. And now we can Docker build it again into, of course, a different tag name. This will normally be done via the CI server, right? The continuous integration server like Jenkins builds the WAR file and builds also the Docker container and makes it accessible. So this is again very fast since it's, uh, it uses the base image containing almost everything. And the push is also then, well, doable at least, even over a slow connection. And this pushes now the new version Hello Cloud 2, to our private Docker registry, which then can be used in Kubernetes. And of course, we have to change our deployment, right? Because now we have a new version. So what we can do, and this is also the um, 
sophisticated way we change our version here and as I say Kubernetes cube control apply checks and tracks all the changes in our c configuration file so normally the CI server would do this and then um, include the code change right and also we could uh, change some number of replicas and so on and so forth this will all be tracked and this means that we now now it's finished will redeploy it right so we have our pod running here it's still the old version of hello cloud that has been running since 15 minutes and we will now apply our new configuration it says configuration change accepted and now the interesting thing is we now have two hello cloud instances with one running that is still the old one and now container creating the new one container creating means over the slow network it pulls the image actually the two version and then it will well run it now what you didn't see it will run the new one and the old one in parallel and with this liveness probe that I specified you can tell as soon as the new one is live and then it will automatically redirect the traffic from our service and this is very nice because then our service is always available it will use the old one until the new one is live and then it switches and immediately with a zero downtime um, approach you have the new instance available so our hello is always there now it's actually already using the new version and this is very nice since Kubernetes out of the box supports a zero deployment zero um, downtime deployment approach with a blue green deployment so with a rolling update you can always switch to a newer version without any downtime since it uses in some point two versions at a time or at least two instances at a time and now we can issue the new request for the new method this is now only available in the new version that's already deployed actually the service has uh, did not change right this is the same port as before the service is always available and now this uses the second application by issuing the JSON object over HTTP to our greeting processor and outputting the result here and if we would want to deploy this on test or production or somewhere else we use exactly the same code maybe with the, with different namespaces for the different environments that we can specify on the deployment but the configuration and more important our code always stays the same since we can eliminate the environment configuration changes or in other words everything that is different will now be tracked from the outside from the container orchestration framework Kubernetes in our case which is very nice since it simplifies um, a lot of things in our application and this makes it actually possible to then well test everything in the same way in all environments I have a Kubernetes cluster running locally here so in the same way as it would run later on in production I can run everything on this machine test it appropriately and later on there won't be any changes so I can b uh, be very certain that later on everything works in production this is a very nice story and well as you saw the benefits of Java Enterprise is that it's actually one of the best ways um, in terms of an implementation in terms of a technology to run in a modern container right since you can use these layers and be very fast since our application is very small we don't have to ship megabytes of Spring Framework implementations in a fat war or a fat jar approach since we have a thin war approach that only contains I can show you only contains the couple of classes that I wrote and nothing else no jar file no implementation or nothing this is all known to the application server and the application server is built once in one layer is shipped once everywhere and then what we continu continuously change all our code changes will only be done in the last layer which is very small do you have any questions left for 
Docker, for Kubernetes, for Java EE, or for Cloud Native in general? Yes. The host name that is resolved. Ah, yes. yes, this is done by the taking the service name. And how this is done, Kubernetes, as it manages the networks internally, will set up internal DNS names. So if the container that runs in Kubernetes will issue a lookup for Hello Cloud or for greeting processor, it will get the actual IP of one of the running instances. And it could then um, access the service and that will route to one or more instances and return an appropriate well, IP so it can resolve that IP. But you only have to worry uh, uh, about these logical names, which is very nice. Yeah, very good question. Any other questions? Well then, thank you very much. I got those I must for your attention. <laughs>